I was born on October 16, 1900, in a suburb of Takamatsu City on the northern coast of Shikoku Island, facing the scenic inland sea. My family was poor, I was the last of five children, my parents had to work their small plot from dawn to dusk. Like most of the farms in Japan, which is one of the most densely populated countries in the world, ours was less than one acre. It did not produce enough to support our family, so my father laboured at night in a home workshop, making crude farm tools for sale. Most of my recollections of my parents are of their days and nights of toil. They had little or no time to play with us children. From early childhood, my two brothers and two sisters had to help in supporting the family. My grandfather, Mochiro Hara, was nearly 70 when I was born. He nursed me and played with me. He had been a real samurai in his youth, and he exerted a great influence on me. Until 1871, the people of Japan were divided into four estates or classes. In that year, all the feudal lords relinquished their titles and estates to the emperor. Before that time, the ruling class was the samurai, as a member of that class, my family had served the Lord of Takamatsu for centuries. The samurai's duty in time of peace was to administer local affairs and to keep constantly in training for a military emergency. In return, the samurai's livelihood was ensured by his lord, so the samurai lived proud and aloof from the mundane routines and considerations of the merchant, artisan and peasant classes. With his status and privileges gone, a samurai found it hard to adapt himself to a new mode of life. Most samurai ended up as failures working at trades for which they were untrained. My grandfather was no exception. It was all he could do to cling to the small farm granted him on separation from the feudal clan. It is curious how closely my own life was to follow the course of my doting grandfathers. The Imperial Navy was disbanded after Japan's surrender in World War II, and I, a naval captain, was without a job. The Allied occupation denied pensions to all former military officers and barred them from holding public office. Thus, for several post-war years, my family eked out a living only by selling personal belongings and doing manual labour. Despite this, I have never regretted my choice of a naval career. I am grateful for the many lessons my grandfather taught. Those lessons helped me to win battles and enabled me to survive defeat in that great war. The toll of my crews throughout the war was lower than that of any other Imperial Navy captain with equivalent combat experience. My grandfather was wonderfully good to me. Because my mother was so busy, he tended and cared for me throughout my infancy. As I began to walk, it was he who took me along to nearby shrines. He would watch me, play with me, and buy candies for me. As I began to talk, he told me endless samurai stories. My mother told me later of grandfather's hope that I would restore glory to the family, for he thought I was the brightest child of the five. I can close my eyes now and see the white-haired old man sitting erect in the samurai manor, morning and evening before the family altar. The altar contained the tablets of his ancestors, as well as that of his own lord, Yorichika Matsudaira of Takamatsu. This daily routine of worship and reciting Analects of Confucius was never varied or disturbed until he became seriously ill. As he lay on his deathbed surrounded by the family, he called my name and asked that I come close. As I was just six, my parents brought me to his side and put my hands in one of his. The other hand clutched his treasured samurai sword, which he finally placed in my tiny hands. He coughed and struggled to say, Tame, this is yours. Now listen carefully to your grandpa's last words. All of us were silent as the dying old man went on falteringly, Tamichi Hara, you are the son of samurai, and you will remember that. A samurai lives in such a way that he is always prepared to die. Don't misinterpret that teaching. Never seek an easy death, for that would be against the true spirit of Bushido. I have told you many times about fine samurai who suffered great hardships to achieve their missions. Try to do likewise. Always be on guard and redouble your efforts to better yourself, though I was too young to understand all he said. The dying man's expression of great affection for me was clear and unforgettable. The following year I enrolled in grammar school. Throughout its six years of courses, I stayed at the head of the class and graduated as the first honour pupil of my family. We were still poor. My brothers, ten years and eight years older than me, were already working. 
neither they nor my two sisters went beyond grammar school. Seeing my fine school record, the brothers persuaded father to send me to middle school, saying, we'll help with his expenses. So it happened that I was able to continue my education. I will always be grateful to my family for making this possible. I passed the middle school entrance examination and was one of five applicants fortunate enough to be chosen for admission. The school was one of the best in Japan, open only to carefully selected children. In five years there, I could not achieve top honours, but I finished about 10th in the class of 150 boys. As that schooling drew to an end, I had to think about a career. Naturally, I aspired to higher education, but college or university required expenditures that were prohibitive for my family. The only advanced education available to me was in government-financed institutions. This meant either a normal school and study for a teaching career, or a military school I was of samurai blood. My choice was the military. I had not forgotten my grandfather's last words. Upon graduation from the Takamatsu Middle School in March 1918, I applied for the military academy in Tokyo, and also for the Naval Academy at Etajima, near Hiroshima. I applied for both because my chances were small of winning either. My preference was the Navy. But failing that, the Army would have been acceptable because I could not afford to wait another year for the next examinations. My grandfather had been a cavalryman. Why did the Navy have so much attraction for me? Perhaps my spirit was simply responding to the tradition of my ancestral region. Takamatsu and its environments have a special naval significance, for it was here that the Japanese Navy had its beginning. The inland sea is to Japan what the Aegean was to ancient Greece. Early Japanese life revolved and developed around the inland sea, with its thousands of picturesque islets, just as the Greek culture began on the shores of the Aegean. The first major naval battle in Japanese history was fought off Takamatsu in February 1185, the following month, a naval force was collected at Takamatsu, and it formed the nucleus of a winning fleet at Danno Ura, in the greatest inland sea battle ever recorded in Japanese history. In the 13th century, when Kublai Khan's mammoth Mongolian fleet with 200,000 men attempted the invasion of Japan from northern Kyushu, the Takamatsu contingent again played a vital role in destroying the enemy at Japan's shore. Michiari Kono, a famed admiral from near Takamatsu, is noted in history books as the man who climbed victoriously on board the Mongolian flagship in the crucial battle of 1281. The entire Mongolian armada was demolished at Hakata Bay. Thereafter, many Japanese fleets streamed out from the inland sea in retaliation sorties against the Chinese mainland. These medieval Japanese fleets functioned somewhat in the manner of modern commandos. Unlike the Mongolian armada, they did not carry large numbers of land troops, for they did not aim at permanent occupation of mainland China. Crack Japanese sailors would land on the continent, chew up the immediately opposing Chinese troops, and return with loot. Chinese history shows that these Japanese commando raiders attacked the China coast until well into the 17th century, and contributed to the toppling of many a dynasty, including that of the famous and powerful Ming. My desire for a navy career was no doubt inspired by the naval heritage of my native province. The Naval Academy at Etajima was one of the most highly competitive educational institutions in Japan. Enthusiastic youngsters who failed the first examination would wait a full year, or even two, for another chance. But my family situation would not allow a year of idleness, so I also applied for the military academy. Entrance examinations for the academies were given in principal cities throughout the country. In April, the month after my graduation from Takamatsu Middle School, I went to nearby Marugame for the army examination. It did not seem too difficult, and I felt sure that I had qualified. The next month, I travelled to Honshu, my first waterborne journey to take the navy examination at Hiroshima. Takamatsu Middle School had sponsored class excursions to Honshu, but I had never joined because of lack of funds. It was quite exciting for an 18-year-old country boy to make this trip for the first time, and all alone, Hiroshima was already the largest city in western Honshu. Its busy, thriving streets bewildered me. I registered in a modest-looking hotel, located in a back alley, away from the busy thoroughfares. This was my first such experience, and as it turned out, my choice of lodging was not wise. 
In Japanese hotels, a guest's meals are served in his room by a maidservant. Mine was in her early twenties, pretty and friendly, so friendly indeed that she made me very nervous. Would you like to have liquor, sir? No, miss, I'm not of age to drink, and besides, I am taking the entrance exams for Ita Jima tomorrow. Ooh, she squealed. So you are going into the Navy? How nice! You will be a terrific officer. Will you come back to this hotel in uniform after you are in school? I'd like to see you again. This conversation made me uneasy. In my typical Japanese upbringing, I had never before talked with young women, except my sisters. It upset me to have this girl keep asking me questions. I barely managed a few curt words of reply each time, and I heaved a deep sigh of relief when she left. I opened a few books I had carried along. I was anxious to study and prepare for the Eta Jima examinations. I pored over textbooks for several hours but simply could not concentrate. A guest in the next room seemed to be having a drinking bout with his maid. Between drinks they sang. This was awful. I realised ruefully that I had picked the wrong hotel. I gave up around midnight and asked at the front desk to have my bedding prepared. In a Japanese hotel room there is no bed. When a guest wants to retire, servants spread futon, bedding on the matted floor. That aggressively friendly maid reappeared and prepared my bed, but instead of leaving she insisted on helping me change and fold and arrange my clothes. I was plainly embarrassed, young gentleman, she said mockingly. You look strained. You need a massage. If you aren't trim and fit tomorrow, you may flunk. She ignored my stammered protest and started to massage my back. I gave in. My name is Noriko, and I am from neighbouring Yamaguchi province, she went on. I have been working as a hotel maid for nearly three years. Sometimes the job is difficult, because not every guest is a gentleman like you. I was silent. And although the massage was relaxing, her words made me more strained than before. I have no more duties tonight, she whispered. You may keep me. Her voice was low, but it struck me like thunder, and I trembled. What do you mean? I croaked. Oh, come, young man, don't play the fool. A handsome boy like you must have known dozens of girls. You better have a good time tonight so you can face the examinations tomorrow with real composure. Oh, please leave me, I begged. I have never had any girl. I have never spoken to any girl but my sisters in my life. Tomorrow's examinations are very, very important to me. You seem to think I'm a bitch, she said in a tone of hurt and anger. I offered to stay with you simply because I fell in love with you at first sight. Also, I know you'll be denied girls for the four years you're at Etajima. I am not a bitch. I will not charge you for my companionship. Listen, all is quiet next door. They are in bed. That was too much for me. I earnestly begged her to leave. Finally, she stalked out of the room, giving me a last look of utter scorn. This awkward incident so disturbed me that I could not sleep. I took the exams next day, but suffered badly from lack of sleep. I did not feel confident about any part of the examinations. I returned to Takamatsu, disappointed and dispirited. About ten days later I received notice that I had passed the military examination and should report to Tokyo in August. I had about given up the idea of a Navy career and was fairly resigned to being in the Army, when a telegram announced that the Navy had also accepted me. I shouted, Banzai! and leaped with joy. Eta Jima, Japan's Annapolis, was a shrine and a subject of dreams to millions of youngsters in pre-war Japan. Every year, hundreds of young aspirants, each with fine scholastic records and recommendations, would compete for the few public or unsponsored openings for admission. One would expect such a selective system to produce brilliant naval officers, but many graduates of this exclusive school were far from brilliant, and some failed completely to live up to the nation's expectations. What I say about Eta Jima and its system is not intended as an indictment. I wish only to present the facts and let the reader judge them. I was enrolled on August 26th, 1918. On that day I put on the snow-white uniform with seven shiny brass buttons and became a real samurai. With the uniform I wore the short ornamental dagger, just as my grandfather had worn it in his youth. Eta Jima is a small island facing the spacious harbour of the naval port of Kure, near Hiroshima, in the Inland Sea. Our course of studies at the academy lasted four years, except for summer vacations and a few short days of home leave. We lived on this island in complete isolation from the outer world. 
Three days after my enrolment, as I was about to enter my dormitory, a third-year man shouted harshly at me, Halt! When I did, he hurried over and demanded angrily, Why did you fail to salute me? I did not know what to answer, as I had not even seen him until after his command. Attention, he roared. Stand with your feet apart and be prepared. I'm going to knock out some of your laxity. He hit me in the face with his fist a dozen times. If I had been standing at attention, his first blow would have knocked me to the ground. This treatment came as a great shock to me. I trudged into my billet, bruised and bleeding. The next day at breakfast, a senior discovered that my uniform was improperly buttoned, and I received another dozen blows on my swollen face. My second assailant was stronger than the first. My left ear kept ringing all the rest of the day. When a plebe was singled out for discipline, all other students in his platoon were lined up and given one blow. All plebes were subjected to this unique system of discipline, from which there was no respite. Each Sunday the 100 freshmen were assembled on the parade ground and made to stand at attention for four or five hours under the broiling sun. Instructors and their upperclassmen assistants kept watching and ordering us. The hours of this Sunday lesson were punctuated by almost continuous fist beatings. After a few months of such treatment, the newcomers became sheep-like in their obedience. Every man's face bore evidence of the brutality we endured. My ear trouble became chronic, and I suffer from it to this day. For some of the boys, the rigours of this discipline did not seem to be too much of a shock. They had perhaps grown up in a similar environment. In some Japanese homes, a stern father chastised his children liberally. In many provincial schools, the boys were treated tyrannically by their teachers. For me it was different. I was the proud son of a samurai family. No member of my family had ever tried to hit me. In my schooling, harsh methods of discipline were never employed. Perhaps I was spoiled to some extent. Perhaps I was not ready for a military career. At any rate, the Etajima discipline outraged and embittered me. Even today I remember those early days in the academy with a bad taste in my mouth. Certain of my seniors were sadistic brutes. They took singular delight in terrorising freshmen. To this day I feel a revulsion at seeing these men, even though we have since shared the labours and miseries of war, and the same luck in surviving it. We were roused by bugles each day at 5.30am, and we studied and drilled until lights out at 9pm, without a moment of relaxation. The harsh Sunday routine continued for six months. Freshmen were then given their first day off, and life became a little more bearable. All regular beatings ended with our plebe year. On days off, no students were allowed to leave the immediate vicinity of the town. Sunday routine was to climb hills, hike around the island, or sprawl in the club. One of my most outstanding classmates was Ko Nagasawa. He came from northern Japan, was a most personable character, and did not seem to mind the Spartan discipline of the academy. He often amazed me with his wise cracks after savage discipline by instructors or elder students. He and I stood near the top of our plebe class of 180 men. He served well in command and staff duties during the Pacific War, joined the new Japanese Navy in 1954, and became its top admiral in 1956. In the Etajima days, he was liked and respected by all his classmates, but no one foresaw such a future for him. I know that many of my comrades look back on their academy days with sweet nostalgia, but because of the physical punishment alone, I do not share their feelings. Letters from home often bore disconcerting news. They were another cause for my unhappiness at the academy. First came the sad news that my elder sister, UTA, had died of tuberculosis. Because she left two small children, my other sister, Kyo, was persuaded to marry Utah's widower. Kyo wrote me of her reluctance and then of her eventual resignation. That situation disturbed me greatly, for I was very fond of Kyo. A year later, Kyo deserted her husband and stepchildren and returned home. In those days, such an act was a total violation of behaviour for a Japanese woman. But I could not blame her. I knew that she must have had good reason. Such developments coupled with the Spartan campus life served to keep me in a state of almost constant distress and depression for the first three years. There was a new commandant for the academy during my last year. This was Vice Admiral Kantaro Suzuki, the first truly great man in my life. Admiral Suzuki was in command for just two days when he summoned a faculty meeting. In a burst of anger, he sternly forbade all physical discipline. 
This school is supposed to produce fine officers, not cattle, he stormed. Suzuki thereupon instituted a series of sweeping reforms in the entire academy system. He sought to encourage the students' interest and thus their desire to learn, and he was unalterably opposed to all forms of brutality. It was my feeling that Admiral Suzuki should have come much earlier. Unfortunately for the school, Suzuki did not stay long. He was too big a man for Itajima, or even the Imperial Navy. He was retired comparatively early to become Chamberlain to the Emperor. In 1945, he became Premier and steered the nation in its surrender to the Allies. After him, a procession of mediocre admirals commanded Etajima, and Suzuki's reforms were gradually forgotten. On July 16, 1921, I graduated 40th out of 150 students. My parents were happy and proud when they learned it. I knew, however, that I could have done better. The year of my enrolment at Etajima marked the end of World War I. Japan took part in that war on the side of the Allies. The nation sustained no war damage, and Japanese businessmen made enormous wealth during the war. With the armistice came world peace and a tremendous depression in Japan. Even at Etajima, secluded though it was from the outside world, the economic depression was much in evidence and reflected by the general atmosphere. Within the year of my graduation, the five great naval powers, Great Britain, the United States, Japan, France and Italy, concluded a disarmament agreement, setting a maximum tonnage for their naval ships. The 150 cadets of my class were assigned to cruisers Izumo and Yagumo. I was in the latter. These 6,000-ton warships had been Japan's main strength in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-1895. Any 25-year-old ship is difficult to operate. A warship of that age is more a liability than an asset. We youngsters, however, were so happy that we could hardly restrain ourselves from shouting with joy. We knew we would soon be leaving on a world cruise. Nothing could dampen our buoyant feelings. The ships were decrepit and awful to look at. But none of us cared. For a month the two cruisers drilled in coastal waters around Yokosuka, our individual chores and assignments were sheer drudgery. Many of us began to look back on Etajima days as if they had been kindergarten time. There is an old saying in the Imperial Navy, Navy casts are made up of officers, NCOs, cattle, meaning enlisted men, and lastly, cadets. In other words, it was generally accepted that the life of Etajima graduates in their initial shipboard assignment was more miserable than that of any recruit, Japanese warships were never built with any idea of comfort for their occupants. They had no regular sleeping quarters for enlisted men or cadets. At night we spread hammocks in any available space to sleep. Meals consisted of rice and barley with some canned fish or meat. The life of enlisted recruits was miserable, but they each had one specific job to learn and could concentrate on that. A cadet, however, had to learn every shipboard duty from boilerman to sextant operation in the fine manner worthy of Imperial naval officers. We had no time to call our own. After a seemingly endless month of arduous training, the two superannuated ships left Yokosuka for the United States on the first leg of the world tour. Many Japanese youngsters were attracted to a naval career, largely because of this chance to see the world. As the cruise ships weighed anchor, there was much joy and hilarity among the cadets. We thought our ordeals were over. How wrong we were! We had failed to reckon with the merciless waves of the Pacific Ocean. Every one of us fell helplessly ill two days after we left Yokosuka. Even I, a rugged, healthy young man, wretched in agony throughout the first leg of the voyage. When we arrived at Honolulu a fortnight later, the young cadets staggered weakly down the ramps. I felt like kissing the ground to thank God for the end of that murderous ordeal at sea. My school nickname, Dolphin, seemed singularly inappropriate on this occasion, and this sorry fish lost thirty pounds in the two-week ordeal. So did many others. Vice Admiral Hanroku Saito, who commanded the training crews, decided to spend a week in Hawaii. This decision was partly in response to the enthusiastic welcome and hospitality of the Japanese population of the islands, but more largely to enable us cadets to recuperate. Our next port was San Diego, whence we cruised south, passed through the Panama Canal, and arrived at New York on October 29, 1921, more than two months after we had left Yokosuka. 
The Five Power Disarmament Conference was then going on in Washington. It is possible that the arrival of our ancient, outmoded ships at that particular time may have been a calculated move. Japan in those days was taking great pains to conceal its true strength. The battleships Nagato and Mutsu, completed in 1920 and 1921, were supposed to be conventional 32,600 tonners, with eight 16-inch guns capable of only 23 knots. The truth was that these 35,000-ton warships with a maximum speed of nearly 27 knots were definitely superior to the USS Maryland. Japan was also not bragging about the completion in 1921 of the world's first aircraft carrier, the 9,494-ton Hosho. Nor was the world told about the 1,345-ton Shimakaze, the new wonder destroyer. She was armed to the teeth with four 4.6-inch guns and six torpedo tubes, and could speed at 40 knots. Meanwhile, two floating junk piles, clumsily manned by cadets, crawled unpretentiously around the American coast. The people of New York City were most hospitable to us when we visited there. On a sightseeing tour, for example, four of us walked into Wanamaker's department store, and a pleasant gentleman who may have been the manager took us to pose for a picture with him. I regret that I have forgotten his name. Of the four boys in the picture, only the one on the left end, later Captain Matao Machida, and I have survived. Machida became a technical officer and specialised in the development of optical weapons. Living in Tokyo, he was an executive of the Canon Camera Company, producer of fine miniature cameras and lenses. From New York, we steamed across the Atlantic, by that time we had our sea legs, and too, that crossing was far more peaceful than the Pacific. We visited England and France before sailing through the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean toward home. We returned to Japan on March 9, 1922, after an absence of almost seven months. By that time, the outcome of the Washington Conference was announced. The results were most unsatisfactory to the Imperial Navy, and many high-ranking officers requested retirement as a consequence. The disarmament agreement concluded at Washington in 1921 permitted Japan to maintain only 315,000 tonnes of battleships, as against 525,000 tonnes each for Britain and the United States, and 175,000 tonnes each for France and Italy. Aircraft carrier strength was limited to 81,000 tonnes for Japan, 135,000 tonnes each for Britain and the United States, and 60,000 tonnes each for France and Italy. As regards cruisers and other warships, the agreement set a ceiling on individual ship size of 10,000 tonnes, but put no maximum on numerical count. The agreement brought tears to the eyes of many Japanese naval officers. Battleship Tosa, 39,900 tonnes, launched in 1921, had to be sunk, and her sister ship, the Kaga, was converted to a carrier. Cruiser battleships Akagi and Amagi, both 34,364 tonnes, were also ordered converted to carriers. Akagi was eventually converted, but Amagi, while in process, was demolished by the Great Earthquake of 1923. The High Command was also obliged to destroy the design blueprints of four 47,500 ton battleships. These drawings had just been completed in 1921 after great effort by many technicians over a period of many months. Naval opinion in Japan regarded the Washington Conference as a case of pure power politics, which resulted in a terrible defeat for Japan. Many people were reminded of the enactment of the anti-Japanese immigration law in California in 1913, which caused the abrogation of the Anglo-Japanese alliance after World War I, also brought to mind was the American boycott of the League of Nations after it had been formed under American guidance. It was in this mental climate that Japan first came to consider the United States as a potential enemy. Young officers and cadets like myself had no experience by which to measure this consideration, but that was the theory which our superior officers drummed into us daily. My class of cadets all received commissions as ensigns shortly after our return from the world cruise. Five of us were assigned to duty in Cruiser Kasuga. In our new role we at once had many things to be concerned about, but the potential enemy was not one of them. The new assignment was not too inspiring for me. It brought to mind the Japanese adage, 
it takes at least ten years to make a qualified seaman. Kasuga was not as aged as Izumo or Yagumo, but she had seen service in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. I reminded myself, you're still a trainee, don't covet such a modern dreadnought as Nagato. Be patient, it's only six years since you enrolled at Etajima. I reported on board Kasuga in May 1922, when the ship weighed anchor, our destination was Russia. At first, the assignment appeared to be a continuation of the world tour. Kasuga, however, was not on a mere training cruise. Its mission was to protect the Japanese residents of Siberia, then in the throes of a post-war revolution. Hundreds of Japanese had been massacred by Russian rebels at Nikolaevsk in 1920. Two years later, Siberia was still in turmoil. The experience for me was much as it had been on board Yagumo, in that we did not fire a single shot. Since the destruction of her fleet by Japan in 1904-1905, Russia had no warships to oppose us. Cayuga's cruise in northern waters was my first shipboard experience in dense fog. In June we landed at Vladivostok, the famed Siberian port whose many sloping hills are reminiscent of Nagasaki. The misery of the defeated Russian people torn by civil war was shocking. What I saw in Vladivostok was in striking contrast to what I had seen in New York and the other thriving port cities of victorious countries. It occurred to me then that a nation must never lose a war. It was beyond any possible dream that Japan would suffer a fate such as that of Tsarist Russia, let alone that it would come to pass within a mere 23 years. After Vladivostok, we visited Odomari, the southernmost port of Sakhalin, which had been ceded to Japan by Russia after the War of 1904-1905. One could not then have dreamed that the sleepy, primitive port of Odomari would be wrested back by the Russians in 1945, and turned into the major naval base that Korsakov is today. The Imperial Navy High Command disdained the use of modern fast ships for the unopposed operations in Siberia, but officers of keen diplomatic ability were chosen to lead the operation, because Japan was not then at war with Russia, and the operation involved many ticklish problems. Kasuga's skipper, Captain Mitsumasa Yonai, was the second great man I served under, like Admiral Suzuki, who had carried out sweeping reforms as commandant at Etajima, he had my highest respect and admiration. But these two men were strikingly different. Admiral Suzuki was a sharp, strong and outspoken character. Captain Yonai was taciturn. Still in his early forties, he was a strikingly handsome and dignified man. During the six months I served in Kasuga, I never saw him scold an officer. Yet the morale of his crew was extremely high. Every member knew he was with one of the greatest leaders the Imperial Navy ever produced. Captain Yonai and Admiral Suzuki shared only one characteristic. They would not tolerate brutal methods of discipline. Yonai's own exemplary conduct was so stimulating that no stringent discipline was necessary in his command. We junior officers were at first startled to find our commanding officer joining us during off-duty hours. He would nod at each of us in turn to grapple with him, after our recent arduous training at Itajima, we were pretty good at judo and knew it, so our approach was timorous at first. Yet we soon learned that none of us could throw him to the mat. I tangled with him on occasion, and although he never took the offensive, he would stand like a rock and defeat the most fierce and aggressive assaults. Invariably, his much younger opponents would come away from such encounters groggy, if not in a state of complete collapse. It was during this tour of duty that I attended my first banquet. It was held ashore in a restaurant when our ship anchored and the local mayor or naval commandant was host. Pretty geisha girls in fancy kimonos served at the banquet. They played music, performed dances, poured sake, rice wine for hosts and guests, and kept the party alive by conversing in a refined and skilful manner. These pretty girls were a dazzling sight to me. In a Japanese party, there is an interesting practice called kampai, or dry cup. In approaching a friend, one fills a cup with sake and invites him to drink. The friend drinks the cup dry, rinses it in fresh water, refills it with sake, and returns the cup to the well-wisher. The friend's only excuse for not drinking the offered cup is that he believes himself to be drunk. I saw every one of forty or fifty guests and hosts reaching and going through the kampai routine with Captain Yonai, one after another, and he would never decline. 
When most of the other guests were helpless, if not sprawling on the floor, Yonai sat straight as a stoic samurai, although he had obliged all well-wishers and had drunk almost as much sake as all the other guests combined. His capacity in all things like his judo ability was unfathomable. I learned that Yonai had been a naval attaché at the Japanese embassy in Moscow before his assignment to Kasuga, and he had trained well in vodka drinking bouts with the Russians. Yonai was also fluent in the Russian language. At the end of such a party, I looked with awe at Captain Yonai sitting like a steel rod, while the others tumbled in disorder. The geisha girls would usually gather around him, doing their utmost to attract and please the handsome, dignified captain, but he was never known to linger with any of them. It was a misfortune for Japan that Yonai had so comparatively few tours of shipboard duty. The Imperial Navy generally assigned its brilliant officers to headquarters duty ashore, and so the outstanding men were usually sadly lacking in shipboard experience. Admiral Suzuki had been retired before the outbreak of the Pacific War. He had no voice in shaping naval tactics, strategy or policy. Yonai was opposed to the war, but his defensive approach was unsuccessful in dealing with the jingoistic army officers who far outnumbered men of his calibre, and he was not successful in getting consideration for his views. The episode is now famous in Japan of how Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander-in-chief of the Combined Fleet in 1941, offered to relinquish his post to Yonai so that he could personally command the Pearl Harbor attack force. Unfortunately, Yonai declined, but I believe he could have done every bit as well, if not better than Yamamoto, in that crucial post. My tour in Kasuga ended on March 30th, 1923, after I had requested assignment to specialist school. I had come to the realisation that much more study was essential if I wished to be an officer like Yonai. From April to December, I received concentrated instruction in torpedoes and gunnery at Yokosuka. While I was at Yokosuka, Japan experienced her worst earthquake of modern times. It struck on September 1st, 1923, in the vicinity of Tokyo and Yokohama, and damage to both cities was multiplied by ensuing fires. The damage was almost as heavy as they received from American bombings in World War II. Martial law was established in the area for a month, and I was put on emergency duty to help enforce it. One of my outstanding impressions from that catastrophe was the prompt American help extended to these two stricken cities of Japan. United States warships raced to Tokyo Bay with relief supplies. That manifestation of unrestrained American goodwill was shattering to the indoctrination I had been getting against the potential enemy. As the year and my schooling were closing, there were decisions to be made about the direction of my career. The careers of officers in the Japanese Navy during the 1920s followed certain definite patterns. Headquarters officers were men with the best academy and specialist school records. They received further education at Staff College. Yonai and Yamamoto belonged to this group. Battleship and cruiser officers had the second best records in academy and specialist schools, but were usually without Staff College education. Officers with third best records in the schools were assigned to destroyers. Submarine officers, fourth rank at the academy, received postgraduate study at submarine schools. Aviation officers, ranking fifth at the academy, volunteered for study at aviation school. Last came the auxiliary ship officers, who received no specialist schooling after Eta Jima. It now seems absurd that aviation was drawing only fifth-rate naval officers in those days. The next 15 years saw marked changes in this situation, when flying came to attract the top men in each class. But that situation serves to explain why Japan failed to adjust from battleship to aircraft carrier dominance, even after air power proved itself as the decisive factor in the Pacific War. The officers who had the controlling voice in the high command thought only about battleships. Officers who were experts in air power did not have enough voice to make themselves heard. Japan's top aviation officer of the war, Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi, for instance, flunked the entrance examinations to the staff college. So did I, and thus a career in destroyers was indicated. But it must be noted that brilliant students do not necessarily make good fighters. My record at Yokosuka was not good, a matter for which I had no one but myself to blame. Out of complacence, after the long regimen of Etajima and subsequent training duties, I had taken to drink. 
Perhaps it was in childish emulation of Admiral Yonai, but I drank very heavily and often reported to class with a hangover. That was certainly bad. Upon graduation from the school I was assigned to sea again. I groaned at learning that my ship was Hatsuyuki, an obsolete third-rate destroyer. She was a twenty-year-old ship of only 381 tons. By modern definition she was more of a destroyer escort, or even a sub-chaser, than a destroyer. But she could still run at 29 knots, compared to Kasuga's maximum of 18 knots, it was the fastest ship I had ever been in. The speed fascinated me, otherwise the new assignment was little more than a continuation of the training voyage. Hatsuyuki was based at Port Arthur, the southernmost naval port of Manchuria, to protect Japanese nationals living in Manchuria and North China. For a year we cruised around Kwantung Peninsula, dropping anchor from time to time at Yingko or Tientsin. But shipboard life had greatly changed for me. An ensign and one of the ship's few bridge officers commanded about 60 crewmen. Life in such a ship is not always easy. Meals were never good. At sea, the crew completely gave up the luxury of a bath. We lacked water even to wash our faces, so no one bothered about shaving. In rough or stormy seas, the ship was most uncomfortable, and we had to hold fast to supports for long hours at a time. The crew, however, was like one big family. Every man was well acquainted with every other. Harsh discipline was never necessary. I began to feel at home and enjoy my duties. I was satisfied with my decision for a destroyer career. In December 1924, I was promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade and transferred to Sanae, a destroyer of about 1,000 tons. This was not much different from my assignment in the Hatsuyuki. In Sanae, we cruised around Manchuria and North China for a year. In December 1925, came the long-coveted duty when I was designated Chief Navigator of Amatsukaze, a first-line destroyer of 1,300 tons. Here was my first real fighting ship in the seven years since my enrolment in Eta Jima. It was thrilling to run the 37.5-knot ship. I was no longer a fledgling trainee but a real Navy officer. It was a realisation of great glory, wonder and achievement. Years later, I would find out how wrong I was. Names of Japanese ships must sound strange to foreign listeners. Many Westerners during the Pacific War called a Japanese ship Maru. It must be noted, however, that warships or other government ships do not have names ending with Maru. Maru has always been, and still is, used only for merchant ships or fishing boats. Maru literally means circle, round or chubby. In medieval Japan, Maru was frequently used for childhood names of boys. For example, in his childhood, Hideyoshi Toyotomi, the famed warlord of the 16th century, often considered Japan's Napoleon, was called Hiyoshimaru, which may be translated literally as chubby or lucky sunny boy. And as a youth, Yoshitsuna Minamoto, the great 12th century general, was called Ushiwaka Maru, meaning healthy and strong as a calf. The Japanese people, by way of personification, came to add Maru to ship names. In the last 100 years, Maru has been dropped from the names of all government ships. Japanese warships, like those of other nations, are classified so that all ships of a given type have names of the same category. Hence, anyone familiar with the system can tell at once from its name whether a ship is a battleship, cruiser, destroyer and so on. Japanese battleships were always named after ancient provinces or mountains. Famed Yamato was christened for the province of Japan's most ancient capital city, Nara, in central Honshu. This word was also used in ancient times to mean the whole country of Japan. This may explain the close attachment felt by the Imperial Navy for the greatest battleship ever built. Her sister ship, Musashi, was named after the province immediately north of Tokyo. Exceptions to this practice are Haruna and her sisters, Kirishima, Kongo, Hiei, originally classed as battle cruisers, and named for mountains. They retained those names even after they were reclassified as battleships in 1930. Heavy cruisers were traditionally named after mountains, and light cruisers were given the names of rivers. Carriers usually bore poetic names having to do with flight. Hosho, the world's first keel-up carrier, built in 1921, means soaring phoenix. Hiryu and Soritsi of the Pearl Harbor attack may be translated Flying Dragon and Blue Dragon, respectively. Kaga and Akagi, 
which perished along with the two dragons at Midway in June 1942, are exceptional names for carriers, because Kaga is a province and Akagi a mountain. The explanation is that these ships were converted from a battleship and a cruiser. Submarines and subchasers had only numbers. Large submarines had the letter Y for a prefix, while the numbers of smaller ones were prefixed by RO. The numbers of subchasers were prefixed by the letters SC. First class destroyers were given meteorological names such as Hatsuyuki, First Snow, Fubuki, Blizzard, Shimakaze, Island Wind, Amatsukaze, Heavenly Wind, Akitsuki, Autumn Moon, Fuyutsuki, Winter Moon, or Yugumo, Evening Cloud. Second class destroyers were named for trees, flowers, or fruit such as Sanai, Rice Seedling, Sakura, Cherry or Kaba, Birch. When a Japanese warship was scrapped, a new one often inherited the old name, but without any signifying numeral like two. Thus, I served in two different ships named Amatsukaze. My first assignment in Amatsukaze allowed me to be in the homeland on active duty for the first time. The destroyer was based at Kura, which is within a stone's throw of Etajima. After living at sea for many months, shore life was quite strange. Whenever I walked in the busy streets of Kura, sailors snapped to attention and saluted me smartly. On board ship or at naval stations it was perfectly ordinary and expected, but somehow it gave me a queer sensation to be in military uniform among the civilian populace. For seven years I had lived in austerity, under harsh discipline and constant training, with hardly any chance for pleasure and relaxation. Now, twenty-six years old, I was chief navigator of a modern destroyer, my monthly pay of 75 yen, then equivalent to 37 and half dollars, was quite a sum in those days. Here, I suddenly realised, was my first chance to enjoy a youthful fling. One Friday night, two other lieutenants and I decided to have our own private party in a Kure restaurant. We called for three geishas, at one yen per hour each. They sang and danced for us, kept our cups filled with sake, and maintained clever conversation which livened the party and made the time pass quickly. The party broke up in time for our return to the ship by the 11pm deadline. As we departed, one of the girls whispered to me, Lieutenant, do come back alone tomorrow night and ask for me again. My name is Utamaru. Please remember me. This petite geisha was the youngest and prettiest of the three. I looked into her tender eyes and nodded, the following night I returned alone to the restaurant and booked her. She sang prettily and danced gracefully, but her greatest charm for me was her lack of sophistication. She was eighteen and had been in the profession for a year. I was your age eight years ago, I said when I enrolled at Etajima. You know Etajima, yes sir, I know it well, for I am from nearby Nomijima. She had a lovely smile. I felt instinctively that her feeling for me was something more than merely professional. Again, suddenly I recalled being her age and my flustering experience at the hotel in Hiroshima on the eve of my entrance examinations for Etajima. That hotel maid had been too overwhelming for any 18-year-old boy. Now the situation was reversed. I emptied many cups of sake and got tipsy, but I no longer cared. I had a 24-hour pass and she lingered that night with me. The status of a geisha is generally not well understood by foreigners. She is not a prostitute, her job is to brighten a party and make it gay. If she lingers with a patron, she does so of her own free will. It is not a routine of her occupation. My restaurant bill, including her fees, came to about 10 yen. Two days later, I was back again. I had fallen seriously in love with the girl and knew it. Within two weeks, I had spent a whole month's salary. She realised what was happening and worriedly confronted me. You must not ruin yourself. Why don't you rent a modest room where I can visit you? so that you won't be squeezed of money. I took her advice the following month when my destroyer returned to Cura from its routine cruise. After renting a room, I went to the old restaurant, booked her again, and told her of my shore base. I was truly sceptical about the possibility of her coming to my room. Utamaru, as was customary, had received from her employer a substantial cash advance at the start of her career. Her widowed father, an impoverished farmer with five other children, received that money her earnings, from which the advance was repaid, were divided with her employer. A geisha had to buy new, expensive kimonos every season, and there was seldom enough income to repay her debt and have anything left to save. To my surprise and delight, 
Utamaru appeared the following evening at my room. It was sheer joy to be alone with her. Everything else seemed unimportant. Indeed, I was even unaware of how great a sacrifice it was for her to come to my place. I thought she was merely forfeiting an evening's earnings, and I gave her five yen in a spirit of some generosity. The fact was that her employer demanded extra money if she went to a non-restaurant place, where the customer was then supposed to pay double the usual charge of one yen per hour. Unwilling to tell me of this situation, she paid the difference out of her own pocket, and while her debt snowballed, she continued to keep our rendezvous. Ignorant of her desperate circumstances, I was having troubles of my own. Every month my salary was spent to the last penny. But I was young and in love, and youth seeks only the joys of life, taking them for granted. The cares must seek out youth. It was five months before they caught up with me. I was just going ashore early one evening in October 1926, when an orderly brought word that the captain wanted to see me. I found him in his quarters, alone, pacing back and forth. His dour look made a chill run down my spine. Lieutenant Hara, be seated. I have something personal to discuss with you. His tone was strangely detached, and he was restraining himself with effort. I wondered what he wanted to discuss. You have been in service long enough to know that in destroyers, unlike bigger ships, we live like a family. As your commander, I ought to know your personal problems and be your consultant. Yes, Captain, you are right, sir. Well, er, uh, I don't wish to meddle in your private life. You are young, single, and entitled to enjoy your youth. But don't you feel you are overdoing it, sir? I mean your girlfriend. I don't blame you for occasionally entertaining a geisha. Yes, occasionally. But you must be going broke living with this girl. That is a bit too much, son. How old are you now? I shall be twenty-six on the sixteenth of this month, sir. Why don't you marry and settle down? You are fully eligible. Your record has been very good. There are thousands of respectable families who would be delighted to have you as a son-in-law. Well, Captain, it does not seem to me that a junior officer's life is too adaptable to marriage. I simply have not thought of getting married. Hmm. And so you live with a geisha. I guess you're right, sir. You stupid idiot. I had never figured you for such a moron. The Imperial Navy cannot tolerate an officer living with a geisha. Are you mad? Are you out of your mind? Forgive me, sir, but I do not feel that Utamaru is a woman of ill repute. If my living with her is objectionable, I'll apply for permission to marry her. The Navy will never approve it. Don't you realise you will ruin your career? I have had a letter of complaint from her employer. Do you realise that your girl has run 2,000 yen in debt because of you? Your conduct is most unbecoming an officer. Change your way or you are finished as a naval officer. I am disgusted talking to you. Get out. I got out quickly. Depressed and miserable, I trudged back and groped for a solution to my problem. There did not seem to be any. In desperation, I finally decided to ask my brothers for help and advice. That night I wrote to both of them. Shigeru, an employee of the South Manchurian Railways, and Sakutaro, who worked in Kobe at a salt transportation company. They replied promptly with bristling letters that showed them to be as outraged as my squadron commander. But, good brothers that they are, each enclosed a few hundred yen, saying it was all they could raise to help liquidate my shameful life. Yet both admonished that they would disown me unless I gave up my immoral life once and for all. The most difficult part of the whole ordeal was my last meeting with Utamara. She was perfectly calm, however and said quietly at the end, I have never even dreamed of becoming the bride of an officer like you. I have behaved according to my own desires, and I am solely responsible for the debt I have chosen to incur. The few months shared with you have been the happiest time of my life. Do not worry about my future. I have recently heard from my aunt in the United States. She is married to a successful Japanese emigrant, and has suggested that I come to America. I am planning to accept her invitation, you must marry into a good family and become a great naval officer. Concentrate on your studies and forget about me. Utamaru was a fine woman. Her real name was Harako Takai. I have never heard of her since, but I hope that she is living happily in America. On December 1st, 1926, I was promoted to Lieutenant Senior Grade and was enrolled again in the in-service school at Yokosuka. For a year I studied in the advanced course of the Destroyer Department, this course was open to officers recommended by squadron commanders as potential future skippers. 
I was in the mood for a change of scenery and atmosphere, and Yokosuka is some three hundred air miles east of Kure. There I was able to fling off the torpor which followed the catastrophic end of my romance. I pursued new studies which filled my time too full for personal sorrow. I was also preoccupied with the growing tension in China. The Chinese mainland in those days was contested by two major warlords, Chiang Kai-shek in the south and Chiang Tso Lin in the north. Chiang's force gained the upper hand early in 1927 and had occupied Nanking by March 24th. There, Chiang's forces made a major mistake. It is a historical fact, although now eclipsed by the later and more publicised Japanese acts, that Chiang's troops sacked Nanking, broke into consulates and molested Japanese, British, American and French nationals. Three British and American warships bombarded Nanking. The Japanese Navy landed a token force in Nanking to protect Japanese residents. As a result, Chiang apologised to these nations and broke away from the communists. In May 1927, Japan landed its army troops on the Shantung Peninsula in North China in an attempt to prevent further incidents. This act, however, served only to fan anti-Japanese sentiment in China. To present-day listeners, such landing actions may seem awkward. In fact, however, China was a country torn by civil war, with two governments and without unified sovereignty. Japan's right of garrison had been acknowledged since the end of the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Still, the Japanese action irritated the Chinese, and both governments encouraged anti-Japanese demonstrations. In the summer of 1927, the Second Disarmament Conference was held at Geneva. Japan adamantly demanded that the limitation of its naval ships be boosted from the previous 60% of either Britain or the United States to 70%. The two leading naval powers would not yield, the conference broke down, the five powers had to compromise on the agreement of 1921. These world developments provided a strong impetus for me to get to work and study hard. By the time of my new assignment, destroyers and cruisers were assuming more importance than they ever had in World War I. Upon graduation from the command school, I was reassigned to shipboard duty, this time as chief torpedo officer in destroyer Suzuki. Pampas Grass. This assignment extended over a period of two years, longer than any of my previous tours of active duty. The ship cruised in China waters, mostly between North China and Formosa, occasionally dropping anchor at Tsingtao, the key port of Shantung Peninsula, then the crucial tinderbox of China. Our squadron was at Keelung, Formosa on April 1st, 1928, when we heard that Chiang Kai-shek had started a long northward drive towards Shantung. This news sent our squadron racing to Tsingtao. There the situation appeared calm, so we returned to the Pescadores on April 15th. The infamous Tsinan incident occurred only two weeks later. The northern troops, demoralised at their imminent defeat, started looting in Tsinan, capital of Shantung. The Chiang force captured Tsinan on May 1st but went on to sack the city, as they had done in Nanking two years earlier. Fourteen Japanese residents were killed, more than twenty others were missing, and all of the 114 Japanese houses were looted and completely demolished. The Japanese army rushed troops from Manchuria and Korea to the scene and restored order. This big stick policy, however, resulted only in embittering the Chinese and this incident sowed the seed for the large-scale Japanese invasion which occurred later. In late 1928, I was at Kobe and met my brother Sakutaro, who urged me to get married. I laughed and said, knowing of my bad background, Do you think I am really eligible, Sakutaro, who has always been a good brother to me? replied seriously. Let me find some good candidates for you. I told him to go ahead, but I did not think he'd have any luck. About a month later, I received a letter from my brother enclosing a young lady's photograph and a few brief remarks in which he recommended her highly as a likely bride for me. Miss Chizu Asayama, 22, was the adopted daughter of Japan's biggest leather goods manufacturer. The letter said that her foster mother preferred a Navy officer as the girl's husband because she wanted to live with her, and a seaman is away from home much of the time. The photo convinced me that she was an exceedingly beautiful woman. She was a graduate of Tokyo's highly reputed Okanomizu Girls Higher School. A daughter of a wealthy family, my brother wrote, her trousseau would contain all necessary apparel, 
and her dowry included five good-sized houses to be rented in Kamakura, a high-class resort town near Yokosuka. The whole thing sounded unreal to me. Why would such a girl pick a man with my background? She could easily have chosen an honour graduate, assured of becoming an admiral. Her family would certainly hire a private investigator to check on my background. I suspected that she might also have an undesirable background relating to men. I showed the letter to my devoted orderly and asked his opinion. The NCO solemnly replied, Lieutenant, my brother is a regular police detective. If you wish, sir, I'll have him investigate her background, I agreed, and a month later his brother supplied me with a full report which said that Miss Asayama was unimpeachable. I first met her early in March 1929 for about an hour. Relatives of both sides were present at this important meeting. On the following day I notified her family of my acceptance and she reciprocated. This was done in the traditional manner of marriage arrangements in Japan. Westerners may consider it strange to make such an important decision after just one meeting. Actually, marriages arranged in this fashion in Japan have proved more successful than many marriages based solely on romance. The meeting was arranged only after full screening had satisfied both sides that the other was acceptable. After such a meeting, a proposition is seldom declined unless a serious defect is discovered.